It's no secret that slavery was once a part of London's economy. At various sites along the Thames, goods produced by slaves would arrive by ship from around the globe to be unloaded at one of the many piers or wharfs that lined both banks. Beyond the waterfront, the areas that now comprise London's modern financial district were also key to the industry. In the streets around the Bank of England, ships and insurance used in the slave trade were sold and bought. Here at 12 St. Michael's Alley is the site of the Jamaica Coffee House. It's where slave owners came to advertise the sale of their slaves and to offer bounties for those who had escaped. It's one of the many sites dotted around the square mile of London that reminds us of the link the city has had with slavery and the profits that were made off its back. And those links may soon become a bit clearer. University College London recently launched a new project titled The Legacy of British Slave Ownership. UCL aims to document the identity of every slave owner in Britain at the time of abolition. Research for the database has already turned up some interesting connections. Documents kept at the National Archives in Kew have uncovered previously unknown links between N.M. Rothschild, of the famous banking family, and James William Freshfield, founder of Freshfield's, the city law firm. The Rothschild family's chief archivist was surprised at the news, as the information was neither in the family's extensive archive nor in the two-volume history written on the family. Both Rothschilds and Freshfields were quick to point to the reformist elements of their predecessors' lives. Now, the Most High has been putting a spirit on a lot of Jake's, but mostly a lot of Edomites that have access to records that regular people don't have to bring out the dirt on these elites, on these banks, on these financial institutions, and coming to find out that every major corporation in America, every major institution, including colleges, every bank, they all have ties going back to slavery. They all jump-started through slavery. And a lot of these banks that you see around, these smaller banks, they're part of larger banks, or they are larger banks that change their names, you know, to hide certain history. But the Most High has been throwing this history back in Esau's face. But that is pursuant to the Apocrypha. The children shall complain of an ungodly father because they shall be reproached for their sake. But there's nothing you can do about it. What is done is done. The Most High is going to set his judgment. Okay, so let's visit Manhattan again back in the days of New Amsterdam, 16th, 17th, 18th century. This is what Manhattan looked like before it was settled. This is a... Uh, computer rendered version and as you can see it was an island and it was mostly greenery and a lot of water and you can see more clearly from this picture that it was Manhattan was basically a marshland there was a lot of marshes and water running through it and actually that body of water you see there in the middle and um, they're actually comparing it to what's there now you see the buildings there but um I believe that is what is today Bridge Street. A bridge was, Bridge Street was built over that land. But the point is, you can see from this picture that most of Manhattan was just water, forests, and trees and marshland. Not really a place to build buildings and to start, you know, industries and stuff. Now, if you look at this picture, it's doing a comparison from Manhattan back then and Manhattan now. And you can see that the land mass is much greater. And the reason is because they used a lot of landfill to create land. And landfill is basically you take soil and just shit, you know, soil and shit, and you pile it on top of each other until you have enough land to build something on top of without it sinking. Now guess what this devil, the so-called white man, used for landfill? If you said slaves, then you're correct. This devil used Israelite slaves to make up a majority of the landfill, which makes up modern-day Manhattan, the financial district today. Now the site I'm on is www.slaveryinnewyork.org, and I'm going to read a, uh, a good article from this site. And it's funny because if you look at the homepage, it's sponsored by J.P. Morgan Chase. 
and all these other companies that had part in the slave trade. But that's okay, though, because you know what? They don't need to have Jake in physical slavery anymore. They got him in mental slavery. And that's much, much more to their advantage. Now, from him, I'm going to go to the article. And this article is called Buried Stories, Lessons from the African Burial Ground. And I'm just going to read a small portion of this to get to the point. Uh, I'll start from the top, matter of fact. It says, in 1991, part of a very old cemetery was found at a building site in Manhattan. A few historians knew what it was, the African burial ground, Israelite burial ground, where enslaved and free Israelites were buried during the colonial period. Many people were very surprised, however. Some thought slavery did not exist here at all. That's still a big mystery. A lot of people, and I'm talking about learned people, don't know that slavery existed in New York. It says others thought there might have been a few slaves who worked on farms and were treated well. Most could not imagine huge numbers of slaves in New York City living lives as hard as the enslaved people in the South. Most had no idea that New York City was a major slave holding area for two centuries. They thought of New York as just a place and slave Israelites escaped to for freedom and opportunity. <laughs> yeah, right. It says by law, when after artifacts and remains are unearthed at a construction site, work has to stop so the area can be examined and reporting findings studied by historians and scientists. Some bones from the Israelite burial ground were removed before construction work stopped. But over time, the remains of 419 people were found. There are many other graves under nearby buildings in Lower Manhattan, perhaps 20,000 graves in all. And that's being nice. There's got to be at least three times that amount. No one had found the bones before because it, because decades earlier, nearby hills had been leveled and the soil deposited on top of the low-lying cemetery. The bones were only discovered in 1991 because a building under construction was a skyscraper. And the digging for the foundation had to go very deep. The excavation was done by archaeologists who numbered and photographed each grave. Then the remains were carefully lifted from the ground and sent to the W. Montag Cobb Anthropology Laboratory at Howard University. The research team was directed by Michael Blakey, an African-American anthropologist. It included many different kinds of experts as well as their top students. Many members of the team were African-American. The graves were at least 200 years old. So all that remained of the bodies was bones and teeth. Sometimes there were other items in the grave, and usually parts of a coffin were found. There were no headstones, so there was no way to know the person's name or date of death. The remains themselves had a story to tell, though, after they were studied and analyzed. And it may be in this article, or it may be another one, but I read that the coffins were all buried facing east proving that they're Israelites. They also did chemical studies on the bones and the teeth, and they found that the people that were buried there were from West African origin, Israelites, pursuant to the scripture in Jeremiah 8. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And what's another word for dung? Landfill. Now, if you remember these, these used to be the Twin Towers. Oh my God, we are... Now, after the Twin Towers were destroyed, Esau, through his pride, went on to make plans to build a so-called bigger and better World Trade Center in place of the old ones. And guess what they found through the excavation process? But before I go into that, I would just would like to read one scripture. 
And the scripture is Revelations chapter 12, 15 and 16, which reads, And a serpent, the so-called white man, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, casting out lies after Israel about where you come from and who you are and about your history, that he might cause her to be carried away of the floods or the lies. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And that's going into archaeology. A lot of these, uh, a lot of history that Esau tries to hide is buried under the earth. And the Most High will throw it back in Esau's face at any given time. So right now, since it's time for Esau to go down and for the judgment of America to be shown publicly by its destruction, the Most High is exposing America's wickedness the so-called white man's wickedness through archaeology and different finds, including this one here.